Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on this episode of the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Let's start with a question. Why is Western medicine completely devoid of common sense? With the majority of doctors prescribing pills for symptoms instead of treating the underlying causes, issues, and imbalances, it's no wonder the world's health is suffering right now. But today we're here with one of the very best doctors I know, Dr. David Perlmutter, renowned neurologist and the author of the newly revised and terrifically titled number one New York Times bestseller, Grain Brain, The Surprising Truth About Wheat, Carbs, and Sugar, Your Brain's Silent Killers. Now before we get to the interview, here's a review that just came in on Apple Podcasts. This one is from Runner Girls Run, she says, Abel and Allison are changing the world. <laughs> I started listening to the podcast about a month ago, and I am hooked. I bought the book and started eating wild and have already lost eight pounds. Seriously loving all the guests you have on the show and your message of health. In the world we live in today, podcasts like these are super important to spread the word. Thanks so much for everything, Abel and Allison. You guys rock. Well, thank you, Runner Girls Run, for leaving the review and the kind words. And also, I'm very impressed you spelled Allison's name 100% correctly. You got the Y, only one L. That doesn't usually happen, uh, especially when people are trying to spell Abel and Allison at the same time. Oh, God. All right. So (laughs) thank you so much for writing in. Thanks for giving the Wild Diet a shot, as well as uh, listening to the show and helping to spread the word. Now, how about you? If you're listening to this, if things are going well or if things are going poorly, get in touch. Just go to fatburningman.com. Shoot me an email. Sign up for my email list. I'm able at fatburningman.com. Just reply to the goodies that I send to you. Let me know how you're doing. Um, tell your story. And uh, and let me know who to get in touch with to have on this show because I'm running out of people to talk to. So <laughs> it's always awesome to get your perspective on things because we're all in this together. I'm not a guru. We are lifelong students and learners and we're doing this together all right so just a quick note over the past year and change i've uh, also been learning about virtual reality and 360 video creation so i've started two new shows at least two new shows in virtual reality one is called adventures with abel where we go to volcanoes we go to uh let's see yellowstone grand tetons america's stonehenge the great serpent mound (laughs) all sorts of crazy stuff that's all free at abel james Dot com And to spell it correctly, it's A-B-E-L. Remember that. Uh, and uh, okay, so the other one is I'm putting out a ton more music, uh, music videos. Some of them very silly, some more serious and laid back and chill. But that's all going to be also at ablejames.com. Some of them are, are 360, 3D music videos, but I'm really experimenting with 180, 3D, 360, um, non 3d 360 3d but all sorts of different formats in audio and video and it's great fun and uh, i appreciate you coming on the ride with me so once again it's ablejames.com for all the artsy fartsy stuff and fatburningman.com for all the health stuff and if you stick around until the end of this episode you'll even hear an, (laughs) an original tune that i made up on the spot improvising about artificial sweeteners and uh, if it sounds like I'm playing multiple instruments at the same time, it's because I have one of those fancy looper things, which allows you to to record a little loop of you playing, say, saxophone or singing or playing guitar or playing piano or whatever, and then layer other instruments on top of it and turn it into a gigantic mess. And uh, I have a, a lot of fun making a mess, and I hope you do too. All right, so if you'd like to support this show then also uh, you can visit wildsuperfoods.com. And that's our new health supplement company that we started basically to help you get the best nutrition that you possibly can. And number two, be our own sponsor so that we can maintain uh, integrity and authenticity and truth on this show and everything we put out there for the world, which in this, in this day and age is easier said than done, but it's working so far. So, uh, but we still need your help. So go to wildsuperfoods.com, fatburningman.com, whether it's the supplements or the educational programs that we put out, or hopefully a- another surprise way coming soon. Uh, I always appreciate your support and couldn't do this without you. All right, on to the show with Dr. Pearl Mutter. You're about to learn why you shouldn't give up plants to do keto 
why Western medicine is devoid of all common sense, how social media harms your brain, how to start stem cell therapy right now for free, <laughs> and much more. Let's go hang out with the doc. All right, folks, I'm honored to say that returning to the show today is our friend, Dr. David Perlmutter. Dr. Perlmutter is a board-certified neurologist and four-time New York Times best-selling author. Thank you so much for joining us once again, Dr. Perlmutter. Oh, I am very happy to be here. Thank you, Abel. It's always a blast talking to you. Uh, you're so eloquent uh, in, the, in the sense that you can simplify very complicated things for people who may not be at all aware of kind of what's going on, whether it's in uh, the world of nutrition or our brains. So uh, I can't believe it's been five years since we first spoke about Grain Brain when you first released it. But from what I've seen, it, it seems like most of the science has supported your claims at the time, which, which many considered to be outlandish or off the wall. So can you catch us up on what the science says and also your experience over the past few years? Well, sure. And I would uh, be the first to agree with you that five years ago when Grain Brain came out, uh, it was very disruptive, and uh, which is, I think, a very, very good thing because yeah. the status quo wasn't working. Uh, you know, rates of so many inflammatory diseases were uh, increasing at that time and unfortunately continue to do so for the same exact reasons. In other words, the high levels of simple carbohydrates in our diets and the absence of good levels of good fat as well as fiber. Those were the real premises of Grain Brain five years ago, talking about gluten as well. And now that we have our new five-year revised edition that uh, has come out, we've been able to look at the literature over the past five years and simply ask the question, uh, was it supportive or was it not? And I think that now it is much more accepted that the level of sugar in the diet, for example, is very threatening, can be very threatening to one's health, one's risk for chronic degenerative incurable conditions, I might add, uh, and how we've got to welcome healthful fat back to the table, the importance of dietary fiber. We talked about that in Brain Maker as it relates to the health of the gut bacteria. So everything has really come together and uh, now the notion of these recommendations is certainly far less disruptive. But Abel, I would totally agree with you that uh, five years ago, people really recoiled at the idea of eating higher levels of the dreaded dietary fat. You know, and basically what we were saying is that there's one study that's been actually a, a pretty extensive study. Uh, that's been going on a while that um, really confirms the idea that we need to eat less sugar and more fat. And that, that study's only been going on for about 2.5 million years. So it's really, you know, something of great value. Uh, you know, the notion of the paleo ideology of trying to emulate the lifestyle of our ancestors, I think, has some very important lessons for us when we recognize that our DNA, our genome, has been honed over a couple of million years to respond to extrinsic signals, many of which are food related. Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, we have turned the tables on that signaling. We have started to send messages through our food to our DNA, and what's coming out of our DNA is not necessarily then good for us. It's interesting to note that, uh, for example, uh, until about 14,000 years ago, uh, historically, the, the size of the human brain has actually increased threefold. Whereas since 14,000 years ago until now, we've uh, noticed a about a 10% shrinkage in the size of the human brain. We know this from looking at the fossil record. We can determine how big the brain was based upon the, the size of the calvarium, the, 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 the volume of the brain space, if you will. So something has changed that's caused the brain to shrink, that's caused our dentition to decline, that's caused bone density to decline. And the major thing that happened 14,000 years ago was a dramatic shift, a quantum shift in human nutrition with the advent of agriculture. Suddenly, we, we got away from um, non-grain uh, plants, uh, mostly good fibrous plants, and good levels of dietary fat, 
uh, to a very uh, much higher carbohydrate uh, resource. And certainly over the past 200 years, that level of carbohydrate, especially simple carbohydrate, has increased uh, dramatically while at the same time we've cut back on, on eating fat and certainly fiber has left the human diet as well to a significant degree. And we're seeing the consequence. I mean, we know that in 19, uh, rather 2017, 2018, for the very first time, life expectancy for men and women in America declined. So, you know, the notion that we're making all these great strides in science and health is getting better, that's not what the data shows. Right. Even I was looking at some startling statistics, which are a bit all over the place, but by 2030, 85, 90 percent of people are looking at obesity or overweight. Uh, and, and oftentimes a lot of the uh, disorders and dysfunctions and symptoms that come along with that uh, in your lifestyle. But one thing you brought up that I think is so important that, that some folks may have lost sight of now that it's trendy to eat more fat is the fact that fiber is important too. When you look at our ancestors, the the lack of fiber in our diets is also unprecedented. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I can. And, you know, uh, I want to relate back to something you said a, a few moments ago about the increasing incidence of uh, overweight and obesity. And I'd like to talk about that with a visual in mind. Uh, there's a graph that's easily obtainable on the internet that shows plotting carbohydrate consumption with obesity. And it's actually a very surprising uh, comparison because yeah. we've seen carbohydrate consumption actually decline over the past few years, which I think to some degree is a good thing, but obesity and overweight continues to increase. So why did these two curves, which were really lined up for years, now suddenly uh, begin to diverge? And I think it's, it's really a good question because uh, you know we've been saying, well, if you eat less carbs, you'll lose weight. It's a little more complicated than that. And yes, obesity rates are increasing. What's happened is people are cutting back on total carbohydrate consumption, and that includes cutting back on fiber consumption. While at the same time uh, that people are doing that, they are realizing the dangers of sugar and doing what? Consuming higher levels of artificial sweeteners, which change the gut bacteria and lead to increasing obesity and overweight and diabetes, I might add. Diabetes being a powerful risk factor for Alzheimer's. So we're really going in the wrong direction. So, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to uh, think about the, the whole concept of messaging. So I, I think what we're seeing is the, the public at large got the message that cut back on your carbs, that's a good thing for you. But it has to be with some caveats that don't throw out all the carbohydrates, that the complex carbohydrates that are the dietary fiber that are, by definition, non-digestible by you and me and everyone else. Uh, are important components of the diet. They're just not stuff or the baggage that comes along when you eat vegetables. Uh, these dietary fibers that we consume are incredibly active biologically, especially as they relate to nurturing our gut bacteria. And as such, that's where the magic happens in terms of controlling our metabolism, lowering our blood sugar, reducing our risk for overweight and obesity and diabetes as well. So that's the big missing part that we need to really emphasize in moving forward and not just, uh, you know, going and buying one of these off the shelf dietary fibers that you see advertised on television that may bulk up your stool. End of story. You really want to get vegetable derived uh, fiber, especially from plants that have high levels of what we call prebiotic fiber. And that's a unique type of non digestible fiber carbohydrate that nurtures the gut bacteria. So these are foods uh, like jicama, which is Mexican yam. We're seeing more and more of that. Um, dandelion greens, garlic, onions, leeks, chicory root. Uh, you can buy a prebiotic fiber at the health food store uh, that is derived from things like acacia gum or baobab fruit, really powerful and well-tolerated uh, sources of uh, uh, prebiotic fiber, again, taking care of those 100 trillion bacteria that live within you, giving them what they want, so they can in turn respond and reciprocate and keep you healthy and help you maintain a normal body weight and help maintain your blood sugar. And as I was uh, responding to your question, I said, well, you can go to the health food store and buy those prebiotic fibers. 
what a notion is that, that we have special stores that we call health food stores where the food is somehow cultivated to be good for your health and that this is a unique type of store. Then what does it say for the supermarket <laughs> and all the rest line. of the grocery stores? What are they? Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, again, the, the importance of dietary fiber, I think, is huge. And uh, moving forward, that's one of the most important things we can emphasize in the coming years. Yeah. One of the concerning things in the past five years or so that I've seen is really um, – uh, the keto diet, and I'm using air quotes, has really exploded, but more in the sense of like Atkins, when that exploded, where it's all of a sudden you're going to McDonald's and getting two patties without the buns, and that's health food. Um, so what what I hear you saying is that it's it's much more about balance than it is about cutting out this one thing or going after this one thing, which is a very kind of Western perspective. But how can we adopt a more holistic way of thinking about our own bodies when we eat something that's affecting our guts, whether it has carbs in it or not? Well, you know, a holistic perspective really, I think, is a point well taken, and that is that uh, we need to reconnect uh, in so many ways. We need to reconnect with our food in terms of looking at it as information, how it instructs our DNA. We need to reconnect with our microbiome, uh, recognizing that so much of what you know what they do, these bacteria, is dependent upon how they're treated, over which we have control. Uh, we need to uh, reconnect with the messaging of our ancestors in terms of the so-called paleo ideology, which did include periods of time being in ketosis, that's for sure. We need to reconnect with ourselves, our neighbors, uh, our communities, other countries, and reconnect with the planet. So uh, on multiple levels, we know we're suffering from disconnection syndrome. And uh, here it's worked. Uh, you know, our ancestors were deeply connected to the signals of the planet, to the signals of their body, to the signals of the seasonality of, of their lifestyle choices. Uh, and modern life is really very much disconnected. And it's not just because it's uh, figurative, it's really quite literal that these reconnections are salubrious, meaning that we, when we reconnect to the, to the diurnal cycle of the day and go to sleep when it's dark and darken our rooms and get restorative sleep, when we reconnect to seasonality in terms of our food choices, these are all important uh, reconnections to chronobiology, the way our bodies are designed to respond to the the, the, the rising of the moon, the setting of the sun, and the seasons as well. So a lot of what uh, we're, we're recognizing is the importance of that. So, um, you know, it's beyond poetic. It's really something that's highly studied uh, in, in research institutions around the world. Yeah. And, and to your point, when you were talking about fiber and prebiotics, a lot of people are just taking all these probiotics because it says probiotic on the label, but it's not just going to quite work like that. You also need the prebiotics and plant fibers along with that. That's right. And, you know, beyond the, um, the notion of nurturing your gut bacteria, I think it's really quite pivotal uh, that people understand that some of their lifestyle choices are actually threatening their gut bacteria as well. Uh, we know that many of the medications people are taking dramatically affect the microbiome, meaning the bacteria, its RNA, and its metabolic products. Um, you know, antibiotics for sure change the array of organisms permanently. There's a strong correlation between the number of courses of antibiotic a person has taken and risk for diabetes, for example. The non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs are another very common assault upon the diversity of the microbiome. Uh, and certainly the acid blocking drugs that everybody believes they need to take are really uh, quite impactful. You know, there has been a lot of research recently uh, indicating a strong correlation between the use of these acid blocking drugs and even risk for dementia and heart disease. So this is important literature uh, published uh, in wonderful peer reviewed uh, journals that we've got to take a look at. Uh, you don't get off easy uh, by making these dramatic changes to the gut bacteria. So. The threatening foods, of course, the artificial sweeteners, the water that has high levels of chlorine, for example. We know that increased gut bacterial diversity, which is what we're looking for, 
uh, is enhanced with uh, more aerobic exercise. Uh, we know that lack of sleep has a negative impact on the gut uh, diversity. So there are lots of lifestyle choices that we've talked about before and we're seeing more and more literature uh, come to light that I think really should um, be uh, vetted and then presented to the public so that you know, in terms of public health, people can make these preemptive changes uh, long before a doctor makes a diagnosis of a chronic degenerative condition like Alzheimer's, coronary artery disease, diabetes, or cancer, which are at their core inflammatory. When we recognize that inflammation, this pivotal mechanism in all of these chronic degenerative condition, conditions that the World Health Organization is telling us are the number one cause of death on the planet, they're all inflammatory, and inflammation comes from the gut, uh, that makes us really think about our food choices because it gives us control. The ball has hit, is hit back to our side of the court. Now we have to play. We have to figure out how we're going to return the ball. We're going to go deep into the corner and really have an impact or decide not to play. And unfortunately, so many people don't think that they are involved in that decision making. It's pretty much you know, a mentality of I'll live however I choose. Then when I get in trouble, I'm sure modern medicine is going to fix it. Well. You know, at least as it relates to Alzheimer's disease, that is uh, that mentality doesn't hold. There was an interesting study published back in November of 2018 uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association by a, a Richard Kennedy. And what uh, Dr. Kennedy did was what's called a meta-analysis. And he looked at uh, 10 different studies that encompassed about 2,774 patients uh, and compared uh, long-term outcome in uh, those individuals diagnosed with Alzheimer's whose family decided that they would take medications and those who decided they would not. And what he found was really quite compelling. Uh, not only did the Alzheimer's drugs not help anyone, but what he found was that those individuals taking the Alzheimer's drugs were actually uh, worse uh, worse off cognitively. In other words, the Alzheimer's drugs were associated with more rapid decline in cognitive function. This is a $1 billion industry. And what, uh, what we've now learned, we've suspected, at least that they didn't work, uh, is that this is doing more harm than good and absolutely violates the notion of primum non nocere, above all, do no harm. It's like giving somebody with high blood pressure a pill that's going to raise their blood pressure. It's not what you want to do. And this is in the context of our knowledge that our lifestyle choices uh, play a huge role in determining our Alzheimer's risk. That's the information uh, that really needs to get out. Bill Gates said recently that treatment without prevention is not sustainable. Uh, and so we've really got to emphasize prevention. Last year, I had the opportunity uh, to uh, speak to the World Bank and International Monetary Fund about Alzheimer's, the global threat, 40 million people currently costing us a trillion dollars more than the market value of Google or Apple. And it's a by and large preventable situation. I mean, if you want to waste a trillion dollars, uh, you know, certainly not all of Alzheimer's pre is preventable, but let's begin that discussion. Let's get the word out to people it's what we did five years ago with Grain Brain. It raised eyebrows. It continues to do so because we're focusing on keeping people healthy, not waiting for the other shoe to fall and then hoping uh, that there's a, a silver bullet to, to treat the problem because it doesn't exist. And as we've now learned, those so-called treatments are actually making people worse. One other thing, I know it's a long-winded answer to your question, but sure. back in uh, February of 2017, in the journal Neurology, they issued what is called a practice guideline recommendation for practicing neurologists like myself. And it had to do with what should we as neurologists be doing when we see a patient who does not have Alzheimer's yet, but does have some cognitive impairment. We call that mild cognitive impairment or MCI. You know, and this is a situation neurologists find themselves in all the time. Should we start Alzheimer's drugs? What should we do? And what the American Academy of Neurology 
told us to do after extensive research evaluating 14 different drugs. They settled on one recommendation, something that was proven in the literature that could slow cognitive decline, just one of the things they looked at. And it was a drug by the name of exercise. Think about it. It's the only thing recommended by the American Academy of Neurology to practicing neurologists to slow cognitive decline in patients with mild cognitive uh, impairment is to get them to buy a new pair of sneakers and do some exercise. And that's, it's astounding to me uh, because they went to that place. You know, my, I, I'm joyful as I even tell you the story right now. A and B, when you read the journal that is supported by advertisements from drug companies, that the journal decided, you know what, we're gonna do the right thing. We looked at the literature, this is the only thing that, that stood up to uh, statistical analysis and we're gonna publish it. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Well, to your point earlier, speaking about drugs, uh, it, it really starts with childhood. And I think I was just on your website where I saw that um, ADHD meds have now been linked to dementia as well. Well, actually, the the, um, the blog that I posted uh, looked at a, a study from the journal Neuropharmacology. And it was interesting because uh, it was linked more, with all due respect, to movement disorder, to Parkinson's specifically. Okay, sure. And the reason they decided to explore it, and they looked at tens of thousands of individuals, uh, because we have the ability now to look at what's called big data and make these interesting connections. And we'll look at another one in just a moment. And, and what they uh, noted was that in children who had taken stimulant uh, ADHD medications, uh, things like Ritalin and Adderall, that their risk as adults for developing Parkinson's disease was increased ninefold. Wow. Now, that's breathtaking because uh, Parkinson's is a disease for which there is no treatment. Yes, the symptoms can be managed, the movement disorder can be managed, the rigidity and tremor are managed to some degree with medication, but the time course of, disease, of the disease is not. Uh, treated in any way pharmaceutically today. So again, uh, what a violation, again, of the notion of above all do no harm and perpetrated on young, uh, on, on our youngest who are being placed on stimulant medication now as young as age four years as approved by the American Academy of Pediatrics while the brain is still actively developing. So, you know, it, it's not like... Um, I make these things up. What, what I do when I blog is I talk about a recent peer-reviewed study and why we should have a pause uh, to look at what we are doing in terms of you know, the utilization of medication. So you're right, that was a very, um, that blog got a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest, a lot of traction because you know, it, it really makes people become aware of things prior to making decisions and that's what that's what the word doctor means. It means teacher. And, uh, and then let people make the right decision, hopefully. So where did all the common sense go in, in both the, the Western medicine profession as well as uh, the people who they're supposed to be treating? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think that uh, what has happened, and uh, a little cynicism here probably doesn't hurt, is that over the past uh, half century, we've seen, um, longer than that, uh, this incredible insinuation between the doctor and patient of the interests of the pharmaceutical industry running the show, um, really creating standard of care, that this is how you treat illness. And if you don't, you're called out. Um, so that you have to treat um, high blood pressure with this list of medications that, you know, to emphasize exercise and weight loss that is clearly effective for high blood pressure is not considered standard of care. That diabetes is treated with drugs, metformin, actos, you name it. Uh, these are, this is the standard of care. I interviewed a woman, uh, a physician named Dr. Sarah Hallberg at Virtus Health, uh, who has reversed type two diabetes by putting people for one year on a ketogenic diet. Not just getting their blood sugars under control and reducing their medication, but curing them of type two diabetes that the medication does not do. Again, 
uh, emphasizing that lifestyle uh, interventions are really important along with managing using medication. Because otherwise you remain on your medication and continue to gain weight. You use more and more medication in the future. As Dr. Uh, Sarah Hallberg demonstrated that the group that did not go on the ketogenic diet after one year actually was taking more medication. So uh, a really powerful interview. And, you know, people like uh, she uh, get called out and, uh, you know, I get um, pointed to as not being in step. Yeah. Uh, uh, several years ago, I visited the office of a very uh, inspirational, good, good friend of mine named Amar Bose. Uh, he created a company you may have heard of called Bose Audio. Yeah. Uh, your headphones are probably made by his company nonetheless. And uh, he had his office, his personal office was enclosed in glass. And he had a quote on his door by Maurice Maeterlinck uh, that said, at every crossroad on the road that leads to the future, each progressive spirit is opposed by a thousand men appointed to defend the past. And it's true that uh, every time we want to be out there and be progressive and challenge the status quo, uh, there is pushback from you know, people wanting to defend the, pa the past. And if you defend the past and remain in the past, it by definition argues against making progress to the future. So again, we have to make mistakes too. And that's important that everything uh, we say and do uh, will be challenged and sometimes rightfully so. And that's a good thing. That's how we learn and that's how we challenge uh, current dogma and make progress. Well, let's challenge the belief that, that drugs will save us, <laughs> for one, because we know the efficacy of exercise, which is pretty much 100%, or at least as close as you can get if you actually do it, right? But when you look at drugs, they don't always where, uh, you know, we're, we're at least on the consumer side, we're kind of brainwashed to think that they all do by the commercials and the marketing and the messaging. But but as a uh, doctor yourself, like looking at the drugs compared to a lifestyle intervention, what does efficacy look like? Well, I, I would say that if you look at what a drug is supposed to do, they're pretty darn effective to some of the time in doing what they are challenged to do. Certainly pain medications manage pain, anti-inflammatories, do reduce markers of inflammation. Uh, blood pressure pills work, blood sugar pills work, and uh, they should be looked upon and part of the armamentarium. Uh, and, but I, I think the, the biggest challenge for physicians is to look upon drugs not as the final solution to the problem. Because drugs generally treat the smoke but not the fire, meaning that they focus on the manifestations of an illness while they completely neglect the illness itself. And as I mentioned with blood sugar, I mean, uh, yeah, they lower blood sugar, but the illness gets worse with time. So that is not really encompassing and broad scope uh, beyond the, the fact that, um, you know, there is hardly a drug you could name that I couldn't list an important side effect. And, you know, of the important drugs that are out there uh, or the commonly used, for example, statin medications are you know, one of the most prescribed medications uh, in America, certainly, and in uh, the developed world, because cholesterol is obviously something terrible, we've got to lower it. Uh, and yet, when you recognize that uh, published research, for example, in a, the journal Diabetologia, demonstrates that in men, uh, that statin medications are associated with a 46% increased risk for developing type 2 diabetes. The Women's Health Initiative, a study of thousands of women uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, demonstrated that women who take statin medications have a 71% increased risk of developing diabetes. Now, why is that important? Well, once you develop diabetes, of course, that adds more medications to your regimen, number one. From my perspective, as a neurologist, when you become a type 2 diabetic, you have as much as quadrupled your risk for a disease for which there is no treatment, and that's called Alzheimer's. So your viewers need to know that type 2 diabetes is strongly associated with developing risk of developing Alzheimer's for which there is no treatment, number one. 
And number two, that by and large type two diabetes is a lifestyle choice based upon foods that you eat. So if we connect those dots, the foods that we eat play a huge role in determining your risk for Alzheimer's. That was the central thesis of Grain Brain. And that's why people got a little annoyed by it because suddenly we are shifting the responsibility back to the consumer to make these choices and away from the doctor who truly shouldn't have this responsibility because there is no treatment for the disease we are talking about. But here it is, it's on a silver platter. It's the keys to the kingdom. If you exercise, which turns on your DNA to make something called BDNF that allows your brain to be protected and actually grow new brain cells. If you cut your consumption of sugar and eat more fat and lower your blood sugar in so doing, our best research, Journal uh, of uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, September 2012, demonstrates a powerful relationship between even subtle elevations of blood sugar and risk for dementia. If you do these things, you already cut your risk for Alzheimer's dramatically. It is not by and large a genetic situation. Certainly there are genetic markers that predispose you, that increase your risk, but they are not genetic determinants. We can override to a significant degree the notion of bad genes causing this disease. We can, to a significant degree, take the diving board off the gene pool and understand that, yeah, I might carry APOE4 or I might carry MTHFR, which gives me an elevated homocysteine, or all of these other technical issues. Certainly, those are genes that increase risk, but by and large, the big players here uh, are the lifestyle choices that absolutely change our gene expression for the better to reduce our risk for diabetes, coronary artery disease, cancer, and even Alzheimer's. It's it's just occurring to me how uh, outrageous and outlandish the claim that you can uh, help fix some of these problems with diet and exercise. Like that, the idea that that's outlandish is just a symptom of, or it shows how crazy the uh, status quo is today. It's, it's like we're seeing progress, but we're also seeing a, a lot of regression at the same time where people. Uh, it's true. They're, they're, for some reason, the self-reliance isn't isn't there as much as, as we'd like it to be. Well, two things. Um, I think uh, it's it's instructive to curse the darkness, but more uh, beneficial to light the single candle. Yeah. And I, you know, I tend to to push more for lighting the single candle and showing, uh, and providing this information. I think it is very important to call out the the parts of this narrative that people don't normally hear on the commercials uh, for the drug. It's there. It's actually there. But when they're reading that script about you know this drug shouldn't be taken by anyone who has a vowel in their name or likely you'll die, you don't hear that because that's when you get all these incredible visuals of the older man with his grandchildren and they're now running a marathon, who knows what it is, but we're taken away from that. We don't hear that voice that is quite literally telling us, hey, this drug might well do you harm. Uh, that is certainly uh, what the literature shows. But I think uh, to get to your point that we become disconnected and that continues from the messaging of our own bodies and the messaging that we can heal and we can be resistant uh, to these very pernicious uh, issues if we only get back to signaling our bodies appropriately with our lifestyle choices. So it is very much about reconnection. And you can even get results doing nothing. I know you're a big proponent of fasting, as am I. I've been doing it for years, although it shows up in different ways in our lives. So I'd, I'd love to check in with you about that. How are you advising people uh, handle fasting in their own lives or, or how are you doing it personally? Well, there, you know, I, I don't even know what uh, what it means, you know, that term, because uh, is it just protracting the time that you have your first meal of the day? Is it not eating for three days or 40 days? Right. Or is it simply going on a ketogenic diet uh, that doesn't necessarily limit carbohydrate? And so there's all sorts of permutations that we are seeing today. For me, uh, I generally eat two meals a day. 
And my first meal is probably two or three in the afternoon. And so that gives me a really significant length of time between having dinner most of the time by 7 p.m. and then uh, having my next meal at two in the afternoon, which is when I break my fast, hence the term break fast, who knew? And uh, you know, during that period of time, and uh, you know, so your viewers know what time is it here? It's 11.40 a.m. for me. So right now I'm powering my brain with ketones, right? Uh, I'm not burning carbs, there are none on board. So does it work? Well, I'm hoping that I can um, connect a couple of sentences and make sense. Uh, you be the judge. <laughs> that said, uh, when we shift over to this type of lifestyle and allow our bodies to reconnect to burning ketones as fuel as opposed to sugar, especially uh, as it relates to brain functionality, I think the research is really clear that ketones, the, the type of body fat or the, the, the manifestation of using body fat after it passes through the liver and goes through a process called beta oxidation. We create these chemicals called ketones. Using them as a fuel has been called uh, by Dr. Veach uh, in the 1960s as a brain super fuel. So we're really upregulating the ability of our brains to do great stuff while at the same time reducing the production of damaging chemicals that are called free radicals that are increased when the brain burns sugar as opposed to burning fat. And um, so it's being a fat burning man, who knew, uh, <laughs> is, is really a pretty exciting and very healthful approach. And again, gets back to a conversation we had earlier uh, about emulating the lifestyle of our ancestors, call it paleo if you will. You know, our ancestors didn't have a ready access to uh, caloric uh, availability 24-7 like we do today. We did fast, uh, and oftentimes it wasn't a choice, but we did encounter caloric scarcity, which turns out to be a positive thing by and large if it's not protracted too long, because when we have caloric scarcity, it actually amplifies survival genes, good genes genes that make us more robust in terms of our immune function, uh, genes that turn on this production of a chemical called BDNF that increases brain power, that helps us grow new brain cells, improves brain functionality, memory, for example. So again, it, get, it gets back to emulating the way it was for us for a couple of million years. Now. There are other ways around the, the, the good way, uh, the good things that fasting does for us. For example, as mentioned, one of the things is fasting increases the production in our bodies of these ketone chemicals that are good for us, that activate gene pathways, uh, that reduce inflammation, that increase detoxification, uh, that increase the production of antioxidants, that amplify BDNF production, that serve as a brain superfuel. Uh, but we can force the body to, uh, or allow, I should say, it's much less aggressive, uh, to make ketones. And we take things like MCT oil or even coconut oil. This provides the raw material, these medium chain triglycerides that are so popular, health food store again, <laughs> uh, that allows your body to make these ketone chemicals like beta hydroxybutyrate that are really important, I think, for, um, for reconnecting uh, once again. And so, uh, again, to get back to the, the question, so fasting can be simply protracting your breakfast till later in the day, one day a week, or every day as, as I choose to do. It can be with a total fast for a 24-hour period that I choose to do as well from time to time. And uh, it can be even longer. I mean, there's so much work written. Uh, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino at University of South Florida has published some incredible work Dr. Walter Longo has created what is called the fasting mimicking diet uh, in which he is allowing the body to engage those genetic uh, pathways without necessarily fasting uh, to any significant degree. Some incredible work that he's doing in cancer and now in Alzheimer's. Uh, so there's a lot of good resources out there that you could tap into to learn more about it. And I think it's very important. And I'm just marveling at the fact that so much of this is done by our bodies themselves. So often we're looking for something exogenous, that that magic bullet, that new product, that new drug or what have you. But 
You know, a lot of times when we look at the research or do some science on the way that our body actually works, it's like you can raise your growth hormone through fasting. You can grow. I, was, I think I was listening to your interview with Dr. Mercola or maybe it was Dr. Amen about stem cells, which is all the rage these days. Super hypey. But your body does that, too. Right. You just have to that, of course. give it the right inputs like exercise. Well, that's a point well, t uh, well taken. That is, uh, you know, each and every one of your viewers can get stem cell therapy today. And it's free. It's called aerobic exercise. That turns on the gene pathway to make BDNF that turns on the growth of stem cells in your brain's memory center where you need them most. So you don't have to, you know, go to Mexico. You don't have to have your blood or fat removed and um, or who knows where those stem cells may come from. Uh, you can make it happen right now. That's an endogenous uh, protocol that you can engage. And so is at least turning down the dial on stress, right, which is so important. Um, and I know we have a lot of high strung type A listeners to this show just because I'm, I'm a recovering one myself. So as I understand, you have uh, a vacation coming up. Tell us a little bit about how you build that into your own life. Well, I will. Um, let me comment on stress just uh, for a moment. And uh, I have a, a new book co-written with uh, uh, another doctor. His name is Austin Perlmutter, uh, MD. And oddly enough, uh, fate would have, that's our son. And uh, the book is called Brainwash. And we wanted to look at stress because it is so destructive on multiple levels, especially for the brain, immune system, et cetera, blood sugar, obesity. And Brainwash focuses on modern day life and how uh, so many influences are stressful that we don't need to engage. And you know, one of the biggest areas of stress that we've identified is people's sense that they're not measuring up, that are, are challenged in terms of whether they ha are worthy or not. And we've identified so many areas that we are challenged day by day that we see the lives of others as being the perfect life as portrayed on their Facebook page or in their selfies. And that is the level to which we must aspire. And when our selfies are not universally loved and we get a lot of likes for whatever we post or we don't, it imposes a really significant and, uh, you know, a short term satisfaction or more importantly, a longer term stress that people are seeking validation and satisfaction in a very short-term way uh, that plays upon, not upon happiness, not upon activating the happiness parts of the brain, but it's, it's more about the immediate gratification part of the brain, that dopamine surge pathway that gives you immediate gratification like when we uh, eat sugar or engage in online shopping uh, mindlessly or any uh, or the, of the other addictive types of activities that are so prevalent these days. And when we engage in those activities, it takes us away from reaching happiness because it distances us from connecting, again, reconnecting a central theme to that part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, that fosters empathy, compassion, and understanding and looking at the long-term consequences of our day-to-day -day activity what we connect to through neuroplasticity by continuing to engage in this online madness, if you will, is we strengthen our connection to the fear center of the brain called the amygdala. That is the short-term satisfaction, the impulsivity part of the brain that doesn't take into consideration long-term consequences of what we do right now. That makes us less compassionate and less empathetic. So that's the purpose of brainwash. It's to allow people to understand what's going on, to give them the tools with respect to understanding how diet influences these connections, lack of sleep or lack of restorative sleep, uh, and even exercise, the incorporation of fasting, for example, how these can, and certainly lifestyle choices to distance ourselves from this constant bombardment, which wants nothing more than to make us buy things and do things, truly, when you think about the real messaging on these social media platforms. It is anything but social media. It's, it's anti-social media, truthfully. Uh, but that said, uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about is this shoenruku idea, uh, which is a Japanese term for forest bathing, 
uh, Shinrin Yoku. And that means, uh, you know, it, it, it really taps into this uh, new research area showing measurable effects of getting out into nature. And we recognize that getting into nature uh, changes our immune response, lowers cortisol, and allows us to reconnect to those parts of our brain, for example. So we, um, at this stage in my life, uh, we, my wife and I realized that, um, you know, it's, it's very, very important. So we uh, uh, spend a lot of time on the water. And uh, what our plan is for this year is to uh, take a boat, uh, our boat, from uh, Washington State through the Inside Passage to Alaska, and we'll be on a boat, just my wife and me, for four months, uh, catching fish, uh, finding places to buy our vegetables, um, reading uh, important things, meditating, exercising, and, and really doing our best to reconnect with each other, uh, with ourselves, and with nature. I think it's really very, very important. And it doesn't always mean like laying out and relaxing. The listeners at this point know that, that Allison... Uh, my wife and I travel all the time, usually by RV, but what you realize is that stuff always goes wrong. And for me in day-to-day -day life, I'm not really a mixed Mr. Fix-It. I'm not going to go, you know, like reframe a door or something like that. But on a trip like this, you have to make yourself useful, right? And I find that that's a very uh, important psychological benefit sometimes when we go on those challenging trips, right? Like going from Washington to Alaska, stuff goes wrong, and then you gain confidence and experience and knowledge. You know what? I'm not going to say I look forward to it because uh, if I do, then uh, maybe that'll be put before me. Right. But, uh, I, I, it is a challenge, and uh, I have always really in, enjoyed those challenges. Uh, I do like I I've always liked fixing things. So, um, but I do want your viewers to understand that. This reconnection to nature might be as simple as buying a potted plant and putting it in your in your living room. That that has an effect. Uh, beyond that, getting outside and breathing fresh air, if that's available to you, uh, is something to consider. Maybe making plans for this coming up weekend to get out and go to a place of nature if that's available to you. But it's just really reconnecting. And as I mentioned, just even having a plant in your uh, in your kitchen that you take care of each day is a powerful way to reconnect to nature. And uh, that allows some very important download of good information that can help you be healthy. Now, we just have a minute or two left. But before we go, is there anything that, that you know or, or might believe to be truth that others think is completely outlandish but might not five years from now? Like, what are you interested in and working on right now? Well, I think uh, what, what has become uh, clear to me is uh, the central importance of reconnection and as a theme. And as I mentioned, it means reconnecting with our DNA, our microbiome, uh, reconnecting with our cells, reconnecting with those around us, families, uh, family members, uh, people in our communities, reconnecting to other countries, uh, recognizing that diversity is key to survival, and you know, reconnecting to the importance of listening to the signals that are coming from our planet and, and abiding by those signals. I mean, we have a, a, a long-standing relationship with the health of our planet. And when we threaten that relationship, the planet will suffer, but the planet will recover, we will suffer, and we don't know what our future will be. So this is the, the major push for me and, and certainly my son in writing our new book and well beyond the book. Um, you know, our, our upcoming website is reconnectglobal.com. We're going to do everything we can to provide information to anyone willing to read it uh, about what you can do as an individual, as a community, uh, from uh, at every level, how to reconnect to your DNA, how to reconnect to the planet. Uh, so it's really important, I think, uh, and, and may some people feel that these ideas are out there. Yes, uh, and that's probably a good thing because, again, it will be disruptive, and that always helps these days to move things along. 
But I think that uh, I would venture to say that everybody, when they think about it, recognizes the importance of this uh, notion of reconnection. So uh, that's what the future holds. Wonderful. Now, before we go, can you please tell folks uh, what you're working on and the best place to find you? Um, you can reach me at drperlmutter.com. Uh, so it's drperlmutter.com. Uh, that, that makes it pretty easy. Uh, our new book is called Brainwash, and the website for that will be uh, brainwashbook.com. And the uh, website that we are working on in terms of reconnection is reconnectglobal.com. Those are all uh, projects that are underway. So, um, you know, that's something that will take shape over a period of years. Uh, and I think will uh, will be something um, that uh, I'm hopeful will be a, a collection point uh, for people to share information and with the, an eye towards the future. Awesome. Well, Dr. Perlmutter, it's been a pleasure as always. Your work is so important. You're a great example to, I think, everyone who's listening, certainly for myself, and I look forward to following your work. So I encourage anyone who's listening or watching, please check out Dr. Perlmutter's work, his books, uh, his, his blog is great. Um, pretty much everything you've ever done. I, I tip my hat. Thank you so much. And thanks for joining us on this show. Well, Abel, thank you. And let's not be strangers. Okay. Let's not go another five years. Let's, let's <laughs> get agree. in touch. And if I'm out where you live, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a call. Hey there, listener. Thanks so much for listening to the very end of this episode. It's a special bonus I'm including a new original song that I made up just for you, live on the spot, as part of my new improv music video series. I hope you like it. You can check out hundreds of these original songs and more for free at ablejames.com. Here we go. This episode is brought to you by Wild Superfoods. Let's start with a quick question. Do health supplements really work? After testing many hundreds of tonics, supplements, powders, and potions over the past seven plus years, my wife Allison and I have found very few companies that we actually trust. Massive, faceless corporations seem to be running the show, often prioritizing profits well above our collective health. Many supplements in stores and online are of extremely low quality, 
are ridiculously overpriced, and some don't even contain the active ingredient they're supposed to be selling. We all deserve much better. That's why my wife Allison and I created Wild Superfoods. We're a small family business, and we take our own products daily because we think they're the best out there. Our Ultimate Daily Bundle provides you with a complete supplement regimen that you can trust to deliver maximum health benefits without the guesswork. Whether you're looking for Mega Omegas, Vitamin D Stack, Probiotic Spheres, or Future Greens, our cutting-edge supplements have you covered. And as a listener of Fat Burning Man, you can save over $80 on a one-time purchase or save over $128 when you select Subscribe and Save. All you have to do is head on over to wildsuperfoods.com. You can type it into your address bar right now to order your very own health-boosting goodies for a rocking listener discount for a limited time. And as always, if you don't love any of our products from Wild Superfoods, then you get your money back. So one more time, all you have to do to check it out is visit wildsuperfoods.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you there. Well, hey there, listener. This is Abel one more time, and I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of the Fat Burning Man Show. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you might be listening to or watching this show right now. And if you have a second, please leave me a quick review for the Fat Burning Man Show. I read every single one of them, and every time you leave a review, it gives us a little boost in the rankings, and that helps other people find this show. And if you can think of someone else who might enjoy and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or a family member. And if they're like, what is this fat burning man thing? That's a really silly name. You could be like, you're right, but here's the deal. We've recorded over 250 episodes of the fat burning man show with thought leaders in health from all over the world. And so far we've won four awards hitting number one in health in more than eight countries internationally. We have more than 30 million downloads already, but we're just getting started. I can't believe any of this, by the way, and couldn't do any of this without you. So thanks once again. But here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode of the Fat Burning Man Show for free with zero outside advertisements, no outside sponsors, and no corporate overlords. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. We'll give you a, a second here just to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes, transcripts, and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show for free. Better yet, enter your email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide so you can take your health into your own hands right now along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now. Enter your best email to get your free goodies with a bonus surprise straight to your inbox. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening once again, and have a great week.